is love. <laughs> How many of you guys remember that theme song, right? It's Frank Sinatra, but you guys remember what uh, TV show's from? Married with Children, exactly. And um, it was a show that I watched sometimes. I mean, a younger, but not quite, the under, quite understanding what was really going on in that entire series. But as you grow older, I think of it now, man, it's all about our relationships, obviously, with the name, the theme song, right? Love and marriage. And uh, the husband on the show, do you want to remember his name? Al Bundy, can't forget like that, right? And so Al Bundy in the show is the husband. And um, he always uh, kind of... Always wanted to remember his glory days as a football player, right? Always talked about his high school football days and how he once scored four touchdowns. And he would go on and on and on about that. And, uh, and along with that, he would also go on and on and on about how his wife ruined his life, right? And how Peggy was, like, the reason why, one of the reasons why he never went pro. And uh, he said, he would say straightforward to Peggy, the reason I'm not a professional football player today is because of two reasons, a bum knee and a bummer wife. And uh, it's just, uh, we laugh, and, you know, because it's a TV show and it's funny, but, you know, it's really, when you think of it, just a really miserable way to live your life, right, as a husband, um, and as a wife, poor wife, even more on her end, right, um, to have a husband that just has such a, a, a horrific, a miserable view of her and life itself and uh, lives in regret. And so uh, today we're going to continue with that kind of theme, um, because sadly, a lot of our marriages in our, in our culture today um, are exists where the wife or the husband and many times both of them live in such regret and misery and it's sad um, where they regret the, the decision they made or the regret living with one another and a lot of times this is because of a warped view of our understanding of marriage and our understanding of love and this warped view began from the very beginning of time um, even and will go as far back as the first marriage and so in our series This Is Us uh, we're starting off with this series talking about marriage and we're looking at it through what lens? Through, yeah, through the scripture. Um, and that's important for us to establish in the beginning of today's time together, is that everything we're talking about and what we're looking at is through the lens of scripture. All right? Because unfortunately, marriage, but also areas like love and uh, parenting, which we'll talk about, and work, and all these things tend with marriages, get easily um, um, uh, 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 torted and, and easily we allow it to become easily... Uh, controlled by culture, and we allow culture to determine how we view marriage, right? And we allow culture to tell us what we, not only how we view it, but what we should expect from our marriages. And so what we should expect from our husband or our future husband, what we should expect from our wives or our future spouses. And, and so the problem with this is that our entertainment saturated culture often helps feed what? It feeds our illusions about reality. Our Satur culture, entertainment saturated culture helps feed all sorts of illusions that we have about reality. And this is what I mean by that. For so long, all right, as illustrated in, the, in, 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 in Married with Children and a lot of our favorite uh, romance movies and also in Disney where you have a prince and a princess who, who with loves one true first kiss or whatever, I have just destroyed that, but with love's true kiss, right out there there's a prince and there's a princess waiting for you. As my niece puts out her hand, I don't know what you're doing there. All right. And we bought into this idea of the one. Right? We've heard that thrown out there before, the one. That out there for you and I and for every, each and every one of us, there's this person that was perfectly created to meet every need that we have. That there's this person, the one, who's been created for you. He's out there. She's out there for you to fill in every gap of your life and to love you the way you deserve to be loved, right? Because God loves you after all, and he created that one person for you to love you the way you deserve. This idea of the perfect husband and the perfect wife leads us down to this idea of a perfect romantic life, right? And this perfect lifestyle that we will live and that this person, the one, finally will fulfill everything in it that we've longed for and, and, and dreamed of in our what we say, soulmate, right? But here's when it all comes crashing down. Reality, again, never lives up to the expectations of those illusions. Sadly, this causes what many hurt in our marriages. It causes, well, worse than that, let the marriages to give up and to, and, and to leave. And it causes many broken homes and split up families as man and woman continue to leave. And then what they do, they go on to the next relationship, hoping that the next one, this guy, this girl, it can be the one. Maybe this next person is the one. This is not, this is not what God intended 
for our marriages. God has a lot to say about marriage. And we, we looked at that last week. And just a reminder, it is God who established marriage, right? He's the one who gave us marriage. And again, remember, we are looking at this in, in the light of Scripture. And so we know that God gave marriage. And he created first who? Adam. And after he said everything was good, Danny mentioned last week, he looked at man and he said what for the first time? Boy, this ain't good. This is not good. I can't leave this dude by himself. And so he creates Eve and he gives him a wife and, and, and this becomes the first marriage as God institutes and marries Adam and Eve. And now we have husband and wife. And so if God is the one who created marriage, we are saying that everything that as believers we want to come to know about marriage, what we want to expect from marriage, how we want our husbands and our wives to be and act, and how we as husbands and wives should uh, live our lives, we need to look at that from Scripture. We need to look at what God expects, not culture. Right? Because unlike culture, right, we said that culture becomes acceptable. what's acceptable today and 10 years from now is going to be completely different. Right, marriage and what's accepted in our relationships change, but not according to God's standards. God's standards are always constant. His standard is not wave with culture and with ideas and what's the latest uh, fad. Uh, God is always constant. His standard that he gave Adam and Eve from the very beginning is still the same standard for our husbands and wives today. And so I want to look at that uh, in our text. And so we're going to be at Ephesians 5, verses 28 through 33. Again, if you have your Bibles or you want to open up your uh, Bible app on your phone, it's Ephesians 5, verses 28 to 33. And I'm going to read that for us um, in a second. In the same way, this is verse 28, in the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. Since we are members of his body, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church to sum up each one of you to love his wife as himself and the wife is to respect her husband. Last week, Danny was kind enough and brave enough to share us, share with us his wedding pictures, right? Because we say with family and family members open up there, embarrass themselves with showing pictures. And so um, since he did that, I felt almost like I had to do it today. But as in everything Danny and I compete with, with um, I want to outdo him. And so instead of showing some pictures, what I'm going to show you guys is actually a clip from our first dance as a married couple. And so uh, get ready with the ahs and oohs and, and whatnot. <laughs> Beautiful, wasn't it? Man, I would never forget that day. All right, so now that's out the way because I'm not showing anything else. Uh, let's get down to more serious business, all right? Um, here's the main point I want to give you guys today. All right, and this point is going to obviously sound like it's directed towards the men, and um, it is. But I also want the ladies, whether you're married, single, to be married, or whatever your situation is right now in your life, I want this also remember for the ladies as well. This is a standard, a marker of what you can expect out of a husband. It's also what you can look at. Your brothers is here as a church and hold us husbands accountable here as a church. And so this is important for everyone here, not just for the husbands, though the point is directed towards you guys. All right, it's uh, fairly simple, but here's the main point. Husbands, it's not up there. I got the main point for you. Husbands are to love their wives, no excuses. That's later on, guys. Husbands are to love their wives, no excuses. Don't embarrass me anymore. All right. No excuses. There ain't no excuses, husbands. You are to love your wife no matter the circumstance. No matter her failures, no matter what she does right, what she doesn't feel like. And get this one, no matter how you feel. All right. It does not matter. God commands you to love her. Now, as a Christian, God has commanded all of us what to love one another. Right. So outside of that, for every single one of us, whether you're young, old, male, female, you're called to be loving and to love one another. Husbands, it's stressed in scripture that husbands are to love their wives. Your wife is a daughter of God, of the, of the Most High. He is a precious child of God. She's a precious child of God who he has given you. And so you are to love and cherish her. And I wanted to point out this a very important point as I, as I read this. Notice that Paul tells, his, tells the husband to love their wife after he tells the wife to submit to her husband. 
Paul's words here in telling the husbands, love your wives, is a safeguard to what he told the wives just a moment ago. Though the wife is to submit to the husband, check, it never excuses the husband acting as a controlling jerk over his wife. Listen carefully, guys, listen up. No husband is entitled to say that he's the head of his wife unless he loves his wife. You're not entitled to say that you're the head of your wife if you can't love her. And that is the truth. One pastor said it this way. He said the reign of the husband is to be a reign and a rule of love. That it's a leadership of love. Husbands, do you love your wife? But you say this to me, Berrios, you just don't know my wife, man. She's, she's difficult. She's crazy. She makes it hard to live with her. It makes it hard to love her. I don't care how hard it makes, she makes it. Love her. Love her good. You don't feel connected, you say. All right. Love her like your closest neighbor. The Bible says this, to love your neighbor as yourself. So if you feel like you're just not connected as a married couple, but hey, she's your closest neighbor, love her. Love her. The Bible commands that. Oh, but you say, we, we just don't love each other anymore. She, 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 we don't get along these days, you know. I, we, we, we're more like enemies. Well, the Bible says what? Love your enemies. <laughs> There's no way around this, guys. No excuses. Love your wife. And this love is possible. Why? Because God commanded it. And when God commands something, he's going to equip you to do it. Love your wife. But now the question is for the remainder of our time, how then am I as a husband supposed to love my wife? What does this actually look like? You would think this is simple, but again, it's not. Sadly, many of us men have done such a poor job of showing what it is to love their wife. Sadly, we come from backgrounds where maybe we didn't have such a great example of a loving husband and loving dad. And so Paul is going to go over this with the church in Ephesus because it's going on. It's playing down there. And so it's the same thing for us. We need to discuss it. And that's something I learned this Wednesday as we discussed it about, you know, the wives submitting. And it was just said over and over, I think a couple of times where it was mentioned, man, these things are just not talked about as often. And so we need to discuss this. And so the first thing that Paul gives us in terms of how a husband is to love his wife in our text was that point that was up there in a second. Husbands are to love their wives sacrificially. You guys had it there for a while, and so I'm going to go on to the, tech, the scripture. You get it, it looks at it here. Look at it this way. In the same way, Ephesians 5.28, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now, how does a husband love their wife sacrificially by loving her as his own body? Now, in this text, you don't, it doesn't say this. It doesn't say husbands are to love their wives like their body. But it uses the word as, and it's important that we, we notice that. As their bodies, because this is something that, that we don't want to miss. He's saying that you're loving her as you would your own body, right? You are and the wife are one. Husbands, you are to, you, husbands, you want to put the right stuff in your body, right? You want to take care of yourself. You want to sacrificially, you know, do what it takes to make sure you're healthy. In the same way, you're to do that when you love your wife. When you put aside your own likes, your own desires, your own opinions, your own preferences and whatnot, and you choose to love and please your wife and meet her needs, then you can say you're loving her sacrificially. Early in the book of Ephesians in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it said this. Paul said, therefore be imitators of who? God, as dearly loved children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us. And what? Gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. It's beautiful. I want to give you a real-life example of this type of sacrificial love. With each pregnancy, my wife and I, right, we have three kids. You guys know that. Um, Joanna had these intense cravings, all right, like really intense cravings. And, and not only just intense, but like very specific like and demanding. Like it had to be this and that, nothing. Like, so here's an example. Now, she wasn't a mean wife or pregnant wife, um, but she had these cravings, and she would let me know when she had them. And Joanna, you don't know. Put your hand down. Um, <laughs> Don't, don't make me get this wrong because then I deal with her later. Um, and she'll let me know in the middle of the night, whatever time of the day, what her, when she wanted, whatever it was. So for our first pregnancy for you, Graceland, um, Joanne had this craving, and I'm going to read it because I don't want to get it wrong, for vanilla ice cream with caramel sauce, whipped cream, and cheese puffs on that, on top of it. So, um, and, and if any of it was missing, so if I left out the cheese puffs because I thought it was gross, then she wasn't happy. 
Um, so I would have to sacrifice and, and love her as I would my as if my body was the one craving these things. And I would have to go ahead and fix this weird ice cream for her um, and, and give it to her, whether whatever time of the day it was. Um, for our second and third child, she had these cravings. It wasn't as weird as that one, but equally intense and demanding. And so she had this craving every morning before church. I had to go and get her a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich. Um, but she also had this craving for a turkey, cheddar cheese, lettuce, mayonnaise on a roll with salty chips. And so, like, every day we pretty much ate that same thing. And, and she, Joe, I got that right? Cool. All right. Husbands, this is walking in love. This is loving her as Christ loved us. All right. And our wives will say this, and as I mentioned this to Joe to make sure, she said that was just a small price we paid for the biggest sacrifice we do in carrying your child. And so that's a direct quote from Joanne. Um, <clears throat> But as we love our wives sacrificially, we're pointing them to the beauty of the gospel. That Jesus so loved us that he gave himself up for us. So when you are to say that you are the head of the household, husbands, remember this. To be the head of the household gives us the responsibility not to command and demand things, but to love and love like Christ. The second way a husband is to love their wife is this. Husbands are to love their wives with provision and care. If you're taking notes, you can go ahead and fill that in with provision and care going on in our, in, our, in our scripture today. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. Verse 29, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. Again, what man does not want to provide and care for himself? Maybe I should correct that. What mature, good man uh, would want not want to care for themselves, right? And um, I remember Danny mentioned it last week, and actually this morning, and I'm, uh, I'm not going to call the person out, but they put a post, and it was funny, and I liked it, um, where it shows a, a wife, and it says, the husband uh, who, uh, is this is the husband who always wants the wife to do everything for them, and it shows a picture of a wife carrying the husband who has a diaper on and a pacifier in his mouth. And sadly, I mean, those are the men that we say, we, you don't want to th- stay away, right? And so the man is supposed to provide and care for the wife. And, and this is actually something that God began to prepare Adam with before he gave her Eve, gave him Eve, gave my words, gave him Eve. All right, God was training Adam for his role to provide, to be a provider, to provide for himself. But also was training Adam to be a provider, to not only provide for himself, but soon to provide also for his wife Eve. And it says this in Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and he placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. So Adam was given the job of work and providing for himself. So a little advice here for the ladies not married yet or looking for someone in the future. If he can't provide for himself right now... Don't, there's no guarantees he's able to be providing for you when you get married. No guarantee. So Adam was given a role to provide for himself, but then to provide for his wife. Now, I don't want to just cover provision and just talk about this as a way, man, you provide financially. That's usually what comes to mind, right? As a man's provider, it means that you got to provide financially. And, uh, um, and it's more, it goes more than that. Some situations, especially today, right, it's very hard for just a man to work or just a wife to work. It's almost impossible, sadly. And so in many, uh, many situations, both wives, husbands work. And sometimes it's the wife who makes the, you know, the high salary. And, and so a lot of times I don't want to look at the man and say, you're failing in your role as being a provider because you're not earning a greater salary than her. Listen, it's not just bringing in the most money, but you are called to provide financially by leading the way in the mindset of, your, of the husband and wife in their finances. So that means you're making sure that you're tithing. You're, you're making sure that you guys are managing your money well. You're, you're making sure that you know, you're saving and, 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 and you're making wise decisions. That's how you lead the way also financially. Don't just get stuck with this, I got to make more money. Don't get stuck with that. Also, it also goes not only just providing financially, but you are to provide spiritually. You're to provide spiritually. Some of the guys usually look at me, but I'm not, I'm not that, you know, I'm not that good. You know, my, my word is not that, you know. I'm, I'm, I, she's, she's actually smarter than me, man. She actually knows more of the word. She's been in church longer, whatever. Man, it's okay. All right, it's okay. Simple. Offer to pray for her. At night, just say, honey, let's let's pray. And you'd be impressed after you pray. She'll look up and be like, man, all right, cool, cool. 
Man, it's true. And it's just, you don't have to have this, you know, scholarly, you know, understanding of the Bible. Though I don't want to just give the excuse and say, don't try and don't aim for, for that. And that goes for everybody in the room, right? Um, but husbands, man, just start the conversations with her. You know, every, not every night, but, you know, every so often I, at night we sit down and I ask my wife, I say, hey, I just want to check your temperature. And it's not, she's not sick. It's what she knows what I'm talking about is that I want to see how are you doing spiritually? What are some of your concerns today? What, you know, through this week, especially this past week, it's been very rough on us, you know, with the kids being sick and, and what's going on here in the church and, you know, and so, and family, just how are you doing? You know, asking her, leading uh, spiritually by, by saying, can I, can, I, can I pray for any of your needs? What are those needs? And so, husbands, you are to provide also spiritually. The second part of our text there said not only to provision but with care. Husbands are to love his wife, are to love their wives with loving, care, with caring love. In another version of the Bible, the North, uh, New American Standard Bible, um, instead of the word caring in that verse, it says it uses the word cherish. And I love that, and I like it because when you look up the word cherish, I'm um, using that 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 uh, version of the Bible, uh, NASB. It literally means to warm with body heat. Now check this out. Listen, check. listen. It, it's used to describe a bird that's sitting on their nest. And I love that because it shows, tells us what? It says, husbands, you are to show this, your wife such a love that you're providing a secure, a warm, and a safe place for her. That's the type of love we're supposed to show our wives. That means when your wife is down and out, and she just needs to know that you got her back. She needs to know that you're right there to give her strength. She needs to know that when she needs to be encouraged that you're there to encourage her. God has given us husbands the responsibility to love our wives in this way. The third point, husbands, you ought to love your wives with an unbreakable love. It's an unbreakable love. We read in verse 1 of Ephesians 5 that we are to be imitators of God. So if we're to love our wives the way God intends us, then guess what, men? It means you're in it for the long haul. It means that there's no giving up. It means that you are to love her with an unbreakable love. Ephesians 5, 31, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Paul is directly quoting Genesis 2, 24 here, and in doing this, he's, he's stressing the importance of unity in our marriages. Husbands, we are to leave our mother's nest. Keep on loving mama. Keep loving her strong, right? Do that. But mom is no longer the one you're clinging to. Mom is no one longer the one you're clinging to. You're now joined with your wife. You're one. This thing is permanent. You're to love your wife in such a way that it's an unbreakable love that she knows without a shadow of doubt that you belong to her and that she can count on you to be there. That she knows that your commitment is not going to waver when, when things go wrong, when after pregnancy or when, you know, the wrinkles start coming or whatever. She knows that you're with her to the end. How can you love, though, with this unbreakable love? It's hard. But the answer is in our last point. Husbands, you are to love your wives as Christ loved his church. So what is the secret to this unbreakable love? What is the answer to that? Christ himself. It's learning to love as he has loved us, his bride, the church. His love for the church, for us, for you and I, is unbreakable. Christ said what? He said, I am the one who builds this church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. That's how our marriages should look. That's how our, that's our attitude should be with our marriages, that it's going to stand strong no matter what. Our marriages should be a testimony to the relationship between Christ and the bride, his church. Paul emphasized it this way in verse 32 and 33. The mystery is profound. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Does our marriages and the love and the commitment that we have for one another, um, does it tell the world about the love that Christ has for his church? What did Christ do? He laid down his life for the church. He laid down his life for us. And I want to end by saying that no matter where you're at in your marriage, marriages, or what you think about marriage today because of culture, our marriages have hope. It's so powerful to hear that. Our marriages have hope. There's hope for our marriages. And I pray that you hear the hope today, that you know the hope today of our marriages is in Christ. 
that because of this hope that we would begin to expect our marriages to look this way. That we would encourage our young men to love their future wives. That we would raise up husbands and wives around us as parents, and we'll talk about that later, to be a man, to be a woman that loves and to, 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 to hold on to the hope that is in Christ, not in the culture. Because it's not found there, right? That the hope rests in Christ alone because Jesus demonstrated his love and laying down his life for us. That despite the church, despite your imperfections, despite my failures, despite our um, sins, and not just sins, but our sins against him. That despite all that, he still showed us his love. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took your shot. He died on the cross. He, he took the punishment of a criminal for you and I. Because he had an unbreakable love for you. A determination to say that my church is going to grow and nothing's going to overtake it. Let's have that attitude and expectations for our marriages. And what I love also is is the example of the cross. He did this without expectations from you and I, right? He didn't say, I'm commanding you to do this first. And when you start listening to my orders, then I'm going to love you the way you deserve it. But he simply just showed us love and grace and mercy despite it all. Husbands, that's the love you should have for your wife. And it's a love that gives us hope because at the end of it all, what did he do? He rose from that grave and he has victory over that sin and death. And that victory is for you and I today. That victory is for our lives with Christ. That victory is for our marriages. That victory is for our children. That victory is for who we are in Christ. That hope is found in Jesus. Let's pray. God, I thank you, Father. Lord, thank you, God, that our hope rests in Christ alone, that our hope is secure, that knowing that you, Jesus, loves us, you died for me, you died for the church, and you love us so dearly, oh God, I cannot just understand that enough, Father. God, I pray that you help me to do so just a little bit more so that I can love my wife, God. I pray for every husband here, God, that you would encourage, that you would motivate, God, that you would pick them up, Father, and you would tell them that there's hope, that they can love their wife the way you command, that you order them to love, Father. God, I pray that we would do so, Lord. I pray for the, for the marriages in our community, God, the marriages in this church. God, I pray that you would be glorified in them, God. I pray that we would be such an example to this world, oh God, that they would know the love of Christ, the love that he has for his church, and that we would love one another in that way, Father. So God be glorified. I thank you for this time that we can share in your word today. It's only in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.